Um, last time I talked a little bit about a study that had been done um, uh, by a sociologist from the University of Texas, which is uh, you know, being, being utterly attacked by the, the left because the results he came up with are something altogether different than what the gay lesbian crowd wants. Uh, it, was a, it was an interview that was conducted with 15,000 families, uh, questionnaires sent out to, to children especially. Uh, all previous studies of children raised in homosexual contexts by a, a parent, one of which at least was homosexual, all previous studies interviewed the parents to see how the children's childhood was. And of course, parents are going to want to paint a rosy picture. This is one of the few studies that actually interviewed the children. But they were, they were ages 18 to 39, so they're children that he could trace some development with. They weren't just little kids. They could see how they turned out. Um, and it, like I say, a very wide representative sample. He didn't just question children about uh, being raised in homosexual situations, uh, but virtually every family demographic imaginable. Um, intact biological families, lesbian mother, gay father, adopted by strangers, divorced step family, single parent, uh, all, all the different possible scenarios. And he, uh, he kind of added it all up. And these are some of the questions that he asked and some of the outcomes. These, these numbers are percentages. So as an example, um, currently living on public assistance. Children 18 to 39 raised in biological families, roughly 10%. Lesbian mothers, 38%. Gay fathers, 23%. Uh, not much different than other, other family types, except this is obviously higher, uh, and this is obviously much lower. In, in virtually every category, children raised by intact biological families, that is, a, a father and a mother in a home, they, they always fare better in virtually every single category. Uh, where it really starts to become obvious, uh, especially of children raised in homosexual situations, are in the sexual areas, as, as you would expect. Um, currently cohabitating with someone, not married, 24% lesbian, Mothers, 21% gay fathers. Divorced is also a horrible number. 31% from divorced families. Uh, currently employed full-time, interesting. Almost 50% of intact biological families' kids, 26% raised by lesbian mothers, 34% by gay fathers. The lowest, the lowest out of all of the various uh, possible outcomes. Um, let's see, where were we here? had an affair uh, while either married or cohabitating. 13% of children in biological families, 40% raised by lesbian mothers, 25% by gay fathers, 32% by step families. Um, ever, ever touched sexually by a parent or adult, 2% uh, biological families, 23% lesbian mothers ever forced to have sexual, uh, sexual contact. 8% intact biological families, 31% lesbian mothers, 25% gay fathers, higher than anything else. It's the, it's the sexual things down here where it really becomes obvious that there is something different happening. So again, claims that are made in the, in the secular world about how uh, gay parents raise children just as well as biological parents are utterly untrue. Now, the way you deal with a study like this, which obviously comes to conclusions very different than what the majority want to hear in the gay community, is you attack it, you denigrate the guy who put the study on, you try and find every fault you can possibly find with it, and if you look this study up online, you'll see article after article, literally, of people cursing at this study because the, the results he came up with are so opposite what the gay community wants to admit. But my point of it is, it's, it's verifiable. This isn't just a religious thing. 
where we as Christians have problems with it, and if we weren't Christians, there really shouldn't be a problem with it. This, this is a statistical thing that children raised in that kind of situation are harmed by it. And even from a secular point of view, damaged children are bad for society. They do not create a stable society. All right, now into what we are today and our discussion today. We've covered some of this already, and we're going to kind of whiz through some of this. Um, the situation we're in today with the gay marriage and the, the wanted uh, homosexual acceptance in, this, in society, I argue, is no different than ancient Rome. In fact, we're not even as bad yet as ancient Rome, uh, but we're headed there. People who say that, the, that people who want to maintain a Christian ethic when it comes to marriage, family, and sexuality are somehow old-fashioned and backwards, my argument is wanting open homosexual and gay marriage is actually more old-fashioned. Uh, it predates St. Paul's letters in the New Testament. The ancient Greece and Rome had open homosexual uh, behavior that was readily accepted by society, also open heterosexual perversity and hedonism. Uh, they had gay marriage. They had it all. Here's a, here's a track of Paul's journeys. And you can see how he kind of goes through everything from uh, Rome and Italy over there to the left, through all these kind of ancient Greek areas through here. Uh, all of these cities were, were Greek, Roman controlled. Uh, in fact, here is the, here's a map of the Roman Empire in the first century. This was all controlled by Rome. And compare that with Paul's journeys, you see it's identical. Every place Paul is going is Roman controlled area. So the, 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 the sexual standards in first century Roman Empire are the things that Paul was speaking about when he writes the New Testament. Uh, and what are those sexual standards? Uh, here's a quote from, from Plutarch, first century. The noble lover of beauty engages in love wherever he sees excellence and splendid natural endowment without regard for any difference in physiological detail. This was the Roman ideal. Sexuality was not a matter of being born anyway. It wasn't a matter of ori sexual orientation. In first century Rome, sexuality was all about the pursuit of beauty wherever you found it, without regard for any sex, uh, gender. So young boys were considered beautiful in ancient Rome. Uh, so we, we had talked once in our previous ones about peder the practice of pederasty, where men, adult men, would mentor adolescent boys and teach them the finer things in life, which included, of course, raping them. Uh, and that would go on until the boy became a man. And then he would adopt a young boy and do the same to him. That was socially acceptable. It was considered part of the male educational process. Uh, there were lots of socially acceptable things when it comes to sexuality that uh, are grotesque. Uh, the love between two men was considered the highest form of love. And it, and it did not negate a, a, a man also having a wife and a family. The idea of monogamy that's important even in the secular world, more or less, uh, in our day, was completely irrelevant in first century Rome. There was no such concern for monogamy. It was, in fact, understood that men had desires that had to be filled. A wife couldn't do it so, alone, so the man was going to have uh, other lovers, whether those be boys or prostitutes or temple priests or priestesses. Uh, now, that was a, another aspect of first century Roman sexual life. Prostitutes, open, uh, everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, the Roman treasury, a major part of Roman treasury income was tax levied against homosexual male prostitutes. It was huge back then. Uh, in Paul's day, in Corinth, 
When Paul wrote, Corinth, uh, wrote uh, the epistle to the Corinthians, Corinth was under Roman control. Uh, but a couple of generations prior to that, it was under Greek control. And it is said that when Corinth was under Greek control, that the temple there in Corinth boasted a thousand prostitutes and made Corinth a bit of a tourist stop. And those prostitutes generated the major part of the Corinthian income. A thousand prostitutes in the temple. By the time of Paul's day, that temple was, wasn't as big as it used to be, but still the, the practice of temple prostitution was going on. Um, we've, we talked last time about how women are kind of considered an unpleasant necessity in this culture. Um, women exist for the sake of procreation, but they are a lesser people. We talked about Pandora, the, the, the myth of how the woman was created how she was sent into the world as a punishment against man. Uh, oops, let's try. Ugh, now I've done it. Hit, hit the wrong button and you are in trouble. All right, uh, get out of there. Get out of there. There. Here's a quote from Plato. Again, this is, this is much earlier than first century Rome, but it shows the consistent pattern for hundreds of years that existed between Greek and Roman cultures. Uh, Plato, homosexuality is regarded as shameful by barbarians and those who live under despotic governments just as philosophy is regarded as shameful by them because it is apparently not in the interest of such rulers to have great ideas engendered in their subjects or powerful friendships or passionate love, all of which homosexuality is particularly apt to produce. He thought highly of homosexuality. Of course, Plato's an interesting guy because other places he rails against homosexuality. Um, and Plato is the guy, of course, who coined the platonic relationship thing. Uh, his view of sexuality doesn't always involve the sex act. Sometimes it just involves loving beauty again. Oh, I did it again. Pay attention. Another thing, pro common practice in first century Rome, which I alluded to last week, it was a practice of same-sex marriage. That's nothing new, believe it or not. They had same-sex marriage in first century Rome. Here's a, a quotation from a Roman historian, Cassius Dio, uh, describing the marriage of Nero. Now Nero called Sporus Sabina, which by the way was a former wife of his that he had killed. Uh, Sabina, not merely because owing to his resemblance to her, he had been made a eunuch, but because the boy, like the mistress, had been solemnly married to him in Greece. Uh, Tigellinus, a friend, giving the bride away as the law ordained, all the Greeks held a celebration in honor of their marriage, uttering all the customary good wishes, even to the extent of praying that legitimate children might be born to them. After that, Nero had two bedfellows at once, Pythagoras, who played the role of husband to him, and Sporus, that of wife. The latter, in addition to other forms of address, was termed lady, queen, and mistress. This Sporus fellow was what today would be called somebody who was transgendered. That is, he liked dressing up like a woman. Nero was married to the guy in a public ceremony that was publicly celebrated. Gay marriage is nothing new. And he's, uh, he's supposedly also not the only Roman emperor to have been married to a dude. There's another one that's highly debated whether he was or not, but there's some evidence there that yet a second Roman emperor was. Uh, 13 of the 14 first Roman emperors, Caesars, were said to be either gay or bisexual. So again, nothing new under the sun. What's being pushed for today is what people have done in the past. This was first century Rome. Any comments? Okay. Now, when you understand what the world was like in Paul's day, and remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. Paul knew Rome. He traveled throughout the Roman Empire. He probably knew Rome better than most because of his travels. He was well-educated. He was a smart guy. He saw what was going on. Paul. You know, Christians in general are often portrayed as these sheltered little people who don't know what the real world is like out there. Paul saw it all. 
when he writes to the churches, Gentiles, Gentile churches, in, in, in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Galatia, uh, in, to Rome, when he writes to these people, he knows exactly what the practice is going on at that time. He saw it for himself firsthand. So what he writes, he's writing to that situation. First of all, before we look at what Paul wrote in the New Testament, first century Rome, it's worthwhile seeing how this carries over from the Old Testament. Scripture's treatment of homosexuality is, is, is nothing uh, limited to, to either testament. It's broad and it extends over both testaments. In the Old Testament, there were very strict punishments that went along with homosexuality. Uh, Leviticus, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it's an abomination. Uh, Leviticus 20, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. It was a death sentence in the Old Testament for homosexuality. Right, now, why why don't we as Christians still insist on capital punishment for homosexuality today? Because we don't. Islam does, by the way. Islam still insists on capital punishment for if you're caught homosexual. Why don't we as Christians? It's in the Bible. This is why. Because not all laws in the Bible are created the same. I did it again. I'll tell you what. I blame my children. <laughs> there are different kinds of law in Scripture. And it's important for us to be able to differentiate them and know what they are. Precisely because of this. Because we Christians are accused of cherry picking what parts of the law we want to follow and what parts we don't. Um, I, I, this is something I was accused of in my first uh, meetings at Iowa State. And uh, this is, was my answer to it there. They, they said, well, why are you saying, why are you just focusing on the homosexual verses in Scripture and saying that that's wrong, and you're ignoring other verses in Scripture, like eating shellfish or pork? You know, do you eat shellfish? I said, yeah. Well, then you're a, you're a hypocrite because you're focusing on one part and ignoring other parts. So what do we do with that? Well, there are different kinds of law in Scripture. There's ceremonial law as, as one example. Ceremonial law had to do obviously with Jewish ceremonies, temple worship, things that revolved around the worship life of the Jews, types of sacrifices that could be offered, times and decorum for sacrifice, order and layout of the tabernacle and temple, qualifications for priesthood, ceremonial washing, Sabbath laws, feasts, festivals. All of these things are part of the ceremonial law of the ancient Jews. Now, ceremonial law had a purpose beyond just law. Most Old Testament ceremonial law was there for symbolic importance, to point to the Messiah. For instance, Old Testament Passover law. Of course, it was a lamb they were supposed to sacrifice. Not just any lamb, a male lamb, first year without blemish. Why a male lamb of the first year without blemish? Obviously because it's pointing to Christ. It's pointing to the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who would be the sacrifice for mankind. So Jewish Passover law had a lot to do with pointing to the Messiah. Um, ceremonial washings that the priests were commanded to do. Again, it has to do with a purification before God, pointing to the forgiveness of sins, uh, the work of the Messiah. All those ceremonial laws had a purpose of pointing beyond themselves to the Messiah himself. When the Messiah came, naturally, we don't need signs pointing ahead to him anymore. So why didn't the Christians continue the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial system? Why didn't they insist, why didn't Jesus himself insist on this ritualistic washing? Sabbath laws. You know, Christ is regularly breaking Sabbath laws. How can he get away with breaking Sabbath laws? It's in the Bible. Because... It was ceremonial law, pointing ahead to him. He was the completion of it. You don't need symbols when you've got the reality there. So the first type of law is ceremonial law. Another kind of law in scripture is Jewish civil law. Civil laws, examples of those. And civil laws just to the, to the society of the Jews, just to the Jews. 
in their daily life. Lending without charging interest, food restrictions, harvest practices. In fact, if you were a farmer back then, you could not harvest the corners of your fields. You're supposed to leave them open for the poor to glean so they had something to eat. Uh, if you had vineyards, you weren't supposed to pick all the grapes. Uh, young brothers taking older brother's widow as wife to raise children in his deceased brother's name. Treatment of livestock that injured, injured people. Responsibilities of livestock owners. There's lots of civil laws in scripture. Uh, do this, and if this happens, this is what you do. Um, in, that, in that verse from Leviticus that we looked at before, you see civil punishments. They shall surely be put to death. Civil law ended with the Jews themselves. It was meant for the Jews, and when the Gentiles converted to Christianity, the disciples never tried to hold them to either the ceremonial law or the civil law. Now, this became a problem for some of the Jews because they didn't understand it. That's why you have a, an, an argument in the first century about circumcision as an example. Should the Gentiles be circumcised or not? The Jews who are circumcised says, yeah, it's commanded in the Bible. We have to circumcise them. Paul comes along and says, no, actually, you don't have to circumcise Gentile, Gentile converts. Why not? Because it's ceremonial law. It's not the kind of law that we have to insist upon. It was pointing to Christ. That's over. Christ has come. The only kind of law that the New Testament applies, in fact, the Old Testament for that matter, the, the, uh, the only law that the Bible applies to us as New Testament Christians is moral law. Moral law, like the commandments, having to do with murder, sexuality, stealing, covetousness, slander, worship of false gods, treatment of parents, treatment of other people in general. This is the only form of law applicable to us as Christians. You recognize moral law in a couple of ways. One, by its repetition in the New Testament from the Old Testament, showing that it was meant for people of both Testaments. You'll see moral law applied beyond Jewish civil society, too. It'll be expected of the Gentiles. Moral law applies to us. Not civil, not ceremonial. So when we get to a passage like that Leviticus passage, that's moral law going on here with a civil punishment. We still insist on the moral law aspect of it, not the civil punishment end of it. Because the civil law end of this ended with the Jews. Now, other evidence that, that the issues of homosexuality are, in fact, moral law issues. Does it repeat in the New Testament from the Old Testament that homosexuality is wrong in God's eyes? Here in Romans, Romans, the seat of the Roman Empire, where homosexuality was the worst, where Caesar himself, in fact, Nero, the guy who married another guy, was the Caesar when Paul was there. Nero is credited for, for murdering Paul. Uh, Nero had him, had him run through the sword or beheaded. So that was the Caesar in power when Paul was writing this. And you can imagine how a, a leader of the world at the time, Rome was the superpower, Nero was its leader, he was, he was the president of the United States. You can imagine how he would have reacted to have some snotty little upstart come in and say homosexuality is wrong in the eyes of God. He wouldn't have taken it kindly. So Romans 1, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debase mind to do those things which are not fitting. It could not be clearer that Paul is saying homosexuality is not pleasing to God. Now, from this, what is the root sin of homosexuality? Homosexuality is a symptom. It is not the root itself. What's the root sin? What's the root sin of homosexuality? Not lost. Good try, though. Verse 25, idolatry. idolatry. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Homosexuality is a symptom of idolatry. Worshiping the creature rather than the creator. When one's, one gets God wrong, then sexuality follows. Christian sexuality is based on the love of God. Uh, it is not just there by force of law. God doesn't just say be heterosexual or else. Why heterosexual? Because it reflects the love of God. Why should husbands love their wives? How should husbands love their wives? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christian love is directly related to the love of God for us. So when you get the God end of that wrong, the love end of that is also wrong. Here, Paul takes up the argument that it is against nature. Uh, even women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Now, I agree with that argument. But I'll tell you right now, that is not an argument uh, that's easy. For one thing, in terms of nature, God obviously made male and female biologically different to complement each other and to produce children. We are, we are made different for the purpose of, of procreation, obviously. We're not the same. And we do have each special organs specially made for the purpose of procreation. So biology demands heterosexuality. If you're a strict Darwinist, well, the, the, the engine running Darwinism is procreation. You've got to be able to produce lots of children to survive. If, if homosexuality was a naturally occurring thing that was prevalent throughout nature, species would die like crazy. Now, uh, so on one, one point, it is natural. On the other point, though, we can't equate human sexuality with nature's sexuality. Because there are things that happen in the animal kingdom that ought not happen in the human kingdom, especially when we talk about human sexuality. What is the purpose of sexuality in the animal kingdom? How do animals use sex? And it's not just procreation. I mean, obviously procreation. What? Dominance. They absolutely will use sex as dominance. Um, are there examples of homosexuality in the animal kingdom? Yes, but you can't remember what. Where's, where's Doug? There you are. Did you get through my book yet? You... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there, I, I, I bought a book. Don't ever look through my library and judge me on the basis of what books I have there. Uh, homosexuality in the animal kingdom. It's, it's written to prove that homosexuality is natural and to, to counteract essentially what Paul is saying here. Now, there are examples in the animal kingdom of, of males mating with males. It's there. Um, monkeys, supposedly, it's not uncommon among, among them. Uh, as an Iowa State student told me, evidently dolphins do that sort of thing too. I'll, I'll never swim again the same way. Um, but this book I've got details pictures of bucks, apparently mating, uh, dogs, male dogs apparently mating. 
So what's going on there is that homosexuality. And I argue it's absolutely not homosexuality. For one thing, those, those bucks that mate with another buck are going to turn around and mount does, too. If anything, if you're going to make any kind of natural argument, you're going to have to argue that it's bisexuality you see in, the na in nature, not homosexuality. There is no exclusively male to male or female to female relationship in the animal kingdom. It doesn't exist anywhere. But there are certainly examples of animals using sexuality as a dominant thing. And you know, I, I, you know I go deer hunting. You get those little dough and heat urine things, vials that I use, you put out there. It says right on there, don't get any of this on you because the buck may react very badly towards you. <laughs> uh, there, is, there is something in, in the mind of these animals that's triggered by scent and pheromones that we as human beings do not understand. And, they, and, and it triggers an immediate response. They don't care what it is. People put decoys out there for bucks and smear the scents on them and bucks will come along and mount the decoy. They're reacting to the scent, not to the sex. It's not an orientation thing. It's pure biology. It's just scent-driven, brain-driven. The bucks, you know for yourself around here, drive themselves nuts at the rut. They lose their minds. Uh, elephants are even worse, I'm told. They go into must and they, they get violent. Um, so, so you cannot equate animal sexuality with human sexuality. And, and in fact, if we did, we would have to say then that, that this forced sexuality in the animal kingdom is acceptable in the human kingdom. But in, among humans, we call that rape. That's not acceptable. There's something we all know, even non-Christians understand, that it's wrong to force sex on a person. But it's okay in the animal kingdom. Uh, I, I always make a point at Iowa State of reminding them, I am no Darwinist. I, I, I am not a Darwinist. Human beings are created in the image of God. We are given something higher than the animal kingdom. So while Paul's argument, again, that it's against nature is true to a degree, you can't just in an argument with somebody who doesn't accept scripture make the claim that homosexuality is against nature. Because they'll point to things in nature where there's sexuality things happening there that rival uh, what they're tr trying to, to promote. All right, any, any comments or thoughts? All right. Um, Paul addresses, again, both, both lesbianism and, and male gayness here. And this, this, is, this is difficult. God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. I had an older pastor once 40 plus years in the ministry, tell me that of all the sins in people he's counseled over the year, the one sin he has never seen anybody actually give up completely was sexual sin. There is something about sexual sin that is addictive. It is a drug. We recognize sexual addiction, in fact, even in, in secular psychology. Um, homosexuality, I argue, also can be an addictive thing to where you actually become dependent on it, like a drug. Uh, in, in fact, there's a study, there was a study done by a gay doctor looking for a physiological difference in, in gay people versus straight people so he could prove that there's a difference that it's not just choice, as Christians say. He found a difference in size in the hypothalamus in cadavers that were supposedly gay versus straight. Now, there were serious problems with the study. For one, it only involved like 15 cadavers, so it was not a very broad base. Some of those cadavers that he characterized as heterosexual had died of AIDS. So how do you know that's heterosexual? Uh, in fact, much higher, I think three out of the 15 died of AIDS, which is much higher than the national average. 
So that it's highly debatable whether or not he was actually properly distinguishing between heterosexual and homosexual. But at any rate, what he claimed to find is there is, in fact, a difference in the hypothalamus. He himself came to the conclusion in writing, and I've, I've got his quote, after this study, that his, his work should not be interpreted as to say that there is a physical reason for gayness. He said, all I've proved is there's a difference. What the cause of that difference is, my study doesn't say anything to. Now, I argue that it, it's actually proven in other things that the brain itself will change in response to action. That it's not action that depends on the brain, it's the brain that depends on the action. For instance, if you go blind and blind people, the, if, if, even if you're born blind, let's say, take it another step, you're born blind, a, 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 a medical thing comes along to give you your sight. Do you know you wouldn't be able to see anyway? Even if they could fix your eyes so they worked, if you were born blind, you wouldn't be able to see because your brain has developed without sight. And you can't just suddenly turn it on. There, there are pathways and things physiologically that have to happen in the brain in order for sight to take place that go beyond just the eyeballs. And if you go blind or you go deaf, there will be parts of the brain that, that actually take over and change. If you lose an arm or something, your, your body and your actual brain adapts to this. So behavior can change brain structure and function. It's not just brain structure that changes behavior. So okay, the guy proves a difference. That doesn't necessarily mean he proved a cause. God gave them over to the base mind. If in fact it's true that the brain itself changes, you see a physiological addiction happening because of a homosexual behavior. That can happen. I believe this is very much talking about a kind of addiction, giving them over. And we do know that God hardens hearts. Now, does that mean you can't change? No, it doesn't. It just means it's very hard. There are groups of recovering homosexuals out there. That's something else they'll never tell you. All you ever hear about is people becoming homosexual who were straight. You never hear about the ones that were homosexual. No, other way around. You hear straight people becoming homosexual. You never hear about the homosexuals becoming straight again. But they do. Uh, there's a group out there called Exodus International, if you want to look them up online. Exodus International. They've got a whole website filled with testimonials of people who have come out of homosexuality back into heterosexuality. And they, they talk about how freeing it is. Uh, so, it, it, you can, you can change, you can repent of it and break out of it, but it's very hard. Oh, I'm going to shoot myself. I did it again? There we go. Uh, consider this one, this is the last one we'll have time to look at. Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Again, this is in Corinth, the city that used to have a thousand temple prostitutes at work. Uh, a city with a reputation as being sexually corrupt. Now, a couple of things. Notice that, that Paul does not, in fact, treat homosexual sin as any different than any other sin. Something else Christians get accused of is singling out homosexuality and railing against it while ignoring heterosexual promiscuity. Maybe there's something to that charge. Heterosexual promiscuity is treated by Paul as just as serious as homosexuality. It's not, homosexuality is not any worse, nor is it any worse than stealing or coveting or being drunk. It's all equally damnable. And notice, equally forgivable. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. The forgiveness of Christ covers all sin, even sexual sins. And it can change people. All right, thoughts or comments? Yeah, okay. 
All right, the question is, if it was so prominent back then, how did it ever become non-prominent? Christianity, actually. Um, homosexual marriage was outlawed in the mid-300 ADs by a Christian Roman emperor, a holy Roman emperor. Uh, so Christianity took over, and it became clear, really, that the Christian sexual ethic was better for society than this. Uh, this, this kind of open Roman hedonism made for a very unhappy society. Uh, people became objects to one another. Uh, there wasn't genuine love. Christianity comes along and teaches love, a surrender of self, a, a, a purity reflecting the love of God, and society got better. So yeah, it became obviously a better solution, a better, a, a better way of looking at the world, and the Christian Roman emperors, starting with Constantine, um, embraced it wholeheartedly and outlawed things like homosexual marriage. It's exactly right. Now Christianity is on the wane. It's not as strong. People don't have any understanding of the love of God, so naturally we're sliding right back to where we were when we didn't have a God in the world, in the Roman Empire. I shouldn't say didn't have a God in the world. We didn't have a God in the, in the public eye that the right God. Any other questions? Oh, the, the numbers on that are very, very debatable. There, there, I don't think there is a firm number on it. I have heard, if you ask the gay community, they'll say as much as 10% are homosexual. Uh, if you ask non-gay driven statistics, it's maybe 2% or less. You know, ironically in the uh, in a study conducted by Rome over its priests, they found a homosexual tendency of approaching 20%. All right, any, uh, any, any other questions? Oh, not the Christian temple, the, the, the temples to their, to their fertility gods. It was part of the fertility rites. Anything else? All right, we'll close there. Next time again, we'll, we'll kind of pick it up with the additional verses, and there's many others that Paul addresses this. And uh, if you have any questions, bring them. So let's close with prayer. Merciful Father, we do thank you for the love that you have revealed to us in your Son and for the way that it does transform our lives. And we pray that by that love, you may give us understanding and truth, that we may live according to it and bear witness of it in this world of confusion. In Jesus' name, amen.